Hi, this is Michael Astor for Ability Fierce, and welcome to season two. We've got a new look, and we've got some special new guests. We've got Nicholas Astor, who's my son. That's a very important reason why Ability Fierce is here, and Kashif Bright, who's his personal care assistant. And he's also a very important part of what happened last summer that made Ability Fierce a thing. Well, he was accepted into SUNY Purchase, but the 19-year-old with cerebral palsy says the school is making it pretty challenging for him to live on campus. News 12's Laura Hayfley has his story. Nick Astor has a habit of making his dreams come true, like being accepted into college at SUNY Purchase. But he's since hit a roadblock. SUNY Purchase has denied his request for special housing. We came to Purchase with a plan, a fully formed plan. We said we want an apartment style setting um, that, you know, he could live with his aide. Two separate rooms inside the same apartment because... We f f could not imagine that anyone could see in any way, shape or form that to live 24 hours and work in the same room is in any way reasonable. Officials at SUNY Purchase denied the request. They say having Nick and his caregiver in separate rooms causes a safety risk. The vice president of student affairs and enrollment says to provide a separate room for the aid risks the safety of the student who needs the aid as well as untrained students who might need to assist in an emergency. But Nick and his father say living in separate rooms is what they've always done and it's no problem because I have a, a phone that Nick can use when he needs help or he can just do this. Watch this. Kashif. Luckily, Nick's learned to yell loud. Ta -da. Ta -da. Nick says the problem with attending SUNY Purchase. I think they worry that I'm just going to be a big fuss all the time and they might not want to deal with that. But it wouldn't be the first time Nick was told no. Honestly, people don't expect people with disabilities to do much. That's just like the truth. But Nick Astor will walk onto campus August 22nd because he says he has to. Even though society doesn't think I can do it, I sure as hell think I can. And I'm going to do everything in my power to make that happen. And this threw a big monkey wrench in our plan. And um, we really didn't know what to do. We were desperate. But we went to the New York Post who wrote a very nice story about Nick's problem. And the mayor, Bill de Blasio, saw it in the post, maybe he saw Nick around Park Slope where we both live, and uh, he tweeted that colleges should be flinging open their doors for a kid like Nick, to have a kid like Nick. And that night, and this really blew our mind, the governor made a statement saying that purchase should accommodate Nick. But that didn't even solve all the problems. We had to hire staff, we had to find people, um, Nick wanted to hire students, and the screening process could take months, and we had about two weeks at that point. There were a lot of other complications. Um, purchase didn't really make us feel welcome, but we did it. And Nick has a great story, and we want to check in to Nick, who's going back to college in just a few days, and see how his first year went, and see how we can take lessons from this that other kids and other parents who have kids with cerebral palsy and other disabilities can learn from so their kids can go to college and have the great experience Nick is having right now. So hi, Nick. Hi, Kashi. Um, Nick, could you tell us a little bit about um, your first year at college and uh, what that experience has been like? It's kind of like, and this is going to sound weird to put it to words, but it's kind of like, I feel like I have a normal college experience, you know what I mean? I think for the first time ever, I think I'm living my own life on my own terms, um, which I think is important and interesting. I'm doing things like going to the beach and taking trips with friends and uh, hanging out in college and outside of college, doing um, regular college things. Um, and I'm exploring the world, which I think gives me a different mindset. I just think I'm being a teenager, which is a weird thing to say when you just turned 20. I don't know, I guess just having student aids, it makes it easier to insert yourself into like community activities and um, have teenage experiences like going to parties and uh, go going to um, going on walks in the woods or the beach or stuff like that because 
Um, they don't, people don't usually see them as raids. They think they're just your friends who are just like doing this out of the kindness of their hearts. And that has some interesting aspects because people are more willing to invite me to things. Um, people are more willing to help me out. Like for example, I remember like um, we couldn't fit the wheelchair in the back of someone's Jeep, so like they helped carry me to the beach. Stuff like that that would personally never happen when it, I would have like a uh, quote unquote grown adults um, help me because I don't know, I think there was just this kind of unspoken barrier of like this is something that grown people do. I think the first year has been successful as far as a program model is concerned. Uh, living with Nicholas as his living aid and working as his personal care coordinator, um, I've been able to ultimately set up his schedule in a way that he has access to be integrated in the community the same as a normal college student despite his physical barriers. So he has the same opportunities to participate in school activities, school events, social activities and events, study groups, and things that go on in college, not just within the classroom, but outside the classroom. And I think that given that module, he's successful and able to do so in ways that other students with physical disabilities or barriers may not be able to. I think it's definitely a model that could be successful for other students with physical disabilities to use because it allows them to be fully integrated into the community in every aspect outside of the classroom. A lot of times people just take care of the situation or set up to make sure that they have access to the room, access to the classroom, but there's not a full scope of college activity that allows them to be integrated and to interact with students 24 hours a day on campus just like other kids would. Well, the thing that probably surprises me the most is that having student aides that I've hired has had an impact on the students that I have as friends. It's made them more willing to reach out and kind of help me um, kind of like go get integrated into the community. For example, my other friend, Nick, sometimes we have dinner together and basically Kashif opens the door for him and I get onto the scooter and we zip to like the dining hall and we talk for a couple of hours and maybe we'll go someplace and then I'll go back and there's no aid. There's never been that experience. I haven't had that experience in high school or middle school or any place outside of college really. Kashif, one of the big things was that a lot of people were arguing, even not the college, but some people were saying like, well, kids have roommates and he should be able to live in a room uh, together with, um, with the guy who's working for him. And I thought this was absurd. I didn't even think this was a question. But could you talk a little bit about that? Well, I've never heard of or seen any experience where there's been a living caregiver that shares a room with their patient or their client. Um, even if you have a caregiver in your home, they don't share a room with the person they're um, taking care of. So I don't see why there would be any difference of expectation, especially in a college setting. Uh, one is a, a professional. Um, I don't work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365. So I wouldn't want to live in the exact same physical space with my client because then I would have an expectation or seemingly semblance of being responsible for working 24-7. Um, I'm not sure any other job or occupation in this country where that would be an expectation. Um, and just like any other job, there's professional requirements in establishments and settings, and it should be the same thing for um, a caregiver or a direct support professional. What college experience is that for a student to be sharing a room with their professional aid? Um, hold up, I'm going to step in and kind of like talk about that some more because you bring up a good point. The idea that kind of like as a a kind of like a client or a patient, whatever you want to call it, perspective of like, well, you d you can live in the same room as a person because this is what you need and there are just certain things in your life that you're going to have to, you know, uh, suck up. Um, I think it, it, it comes into this kind of discussion of humanity and kind of like, I think that society kind of sees disabled people as kind of like less than human, so they are it's kind of okay to put them in less than human conditions. You know what I mean? Like they don't need privacy because they must be used to like having someone help them all the time. And like, uh, you're, it's just kind of like, you're just lucky that someone is here to help you and you're having a college experience and kind of put up with it, which I think leads to a lot of problems and kind of like trying to articulate the college experience. You know what I mean? I think as a disabled person, 
you put up with a lot because society just told you that you have to pull up, put up with it. So, for example, oh, you can't go to so-and-so's party because they have stairs. I guess that's just something you're going to have to live with. And if anything, if the college experience has taught me anything, is that, like, you don't have to really put up with everything that people tell you you have to put up with, right? When there's a will, there's a way. If someone's willing to help you um, get to a location to have your social activity or to have a full-fledged, not only college experience, but a human experience, I think that you should take it and try to execute it by any means necessary, really. Okay, Nick, Kishi, what, what's been the best experience you've had this year um, at college? I think that, honestly, the best thing that happened this year is that, like, um, I can go to a place and I can go to um, a party, you know what I mean? And the reason, I'm not just saying that because, okay, so a lot of times I remember when I was in middle school and everybody was having their bar mitzvahs, and now when I was in high school and everybody was having their kins and years, I didn't really get invited to many of those, right? But suddenly, as... I'm integrated with um, students and I meet their friends, they become my friends. Suddenly I'm open to this whole new world of like, now we can do stuff together. And I think that that's from the party I've been able to open up to like going to walks in the park with people that I've met at parties and I'm just kind of like, hey, I like you and I want to spend time with you as a human being. And then that spread to like going outside of Purchase College um, and going to the beach, uh, Playland, which is in Rye Beach, you know what I mean? It's From that moment, it was very important because it inserted me into the college experience as a social person. A physical disability or accessibility was never something I had to think about in any aspect of my college experience. So when you are working with someone that does have a physical disability, it opens your eyes to so many different concerns or barriers that they have to contest with just to exist in the same spaces as every other student. So for me, the, the best part about this year was just seeing how much Nick was able to be integrated into the community of his campus the same way the average student without a physical disability would be. Um, and I know he's spoken a lot about parties, but I think he means more than just going to an actual in, uh, a social party. Everything from just being able to have lunch in the dining hall with his friends like regular students without having to worry about his disability being a barrier for him for that. Um, going to campus events, uh, movie nights, going to lecture experiences, getting to leave the campus, going to experience the community of White Plains the same way the average student would. Yeah. Um, all those different experiences that every other student at that campus is having, the best part for me is knowing that Nicholas is having those same experiences regardless of his physical disability and it not being a barrier or a limitation for him. Yeah. Uh, so what has been the worst experience you've had? The worst experience, I would say, would just be an overall lack of community amongst the university's administration. Um, one, being a professional that's working on the campus of the university, though I don't work for the university, I am working professionally at that university. And I don't feel there's uh, been much of a linkage or a connection um, as far as the administration or Office of Disability Services with me as an individual, um, particularly even from just a general introduction or welcome to the campus that never took place throughout uh, a year of being there. Um, that to me is a bit disconcerting. It's I think that like they give you support, so they give you a note taker, they give you um, kind of like technologies that could help you uh, succeed in class, right? But I think that, um, I think that what we have to, disabled people have to prove to colleges is that disabled people are, you can invest in them and they can be productive members of society in the future. And I think the lacking willingness to go and help um, disabled people on multiple levels speaks to how um, they're just like, oh, they, they paid the money to go to college, so we'll let them go to college, but we're not really going to take them, like, seriously. So, Nick, you have all this round-the-clock care. You have these student aides, but uh, so what happens, like, if you want to go on a date or do something a little bit more intimate? Is that a problem? That That's complicated, and I kind of, like, 
uh, jo joke around with that because it's kind of like they have to write notes to like what they're gonna do, what they did with me for that day, and we kind of like what do we write when Nick goes on a date? Help Nick with dating? Like, wh how does it work? And I'm personally still trying to figure it out, so I don't think I could answer that question fully. But the point is that like, what's been really useful is that because the students kind of make it e uh, like a feasible thing to help me, oftentimes they just put me in the scooter or the way I'm gonna move around campus and then they're just gonna go, okay, bye Nick, I'll see you in like an hour or two. The trick is to kind of like um, not have them there when you're having something intimate, like a dating life or something like that. I have run into problems where it's kind of like they're there and they kind of take control of the conversation, which it depends on the person on that, um, and it's really sucky, but the trick to that is to set boundaries and to kind of like um, talk beforehand and be like, okay, I'm going on a date, I need you to do this and that for me and then leave. Um, but surprisingly, when I've had like intimate dating experiences with people, um, because there's a student aid, there seems to be a more of a willingness to understand and to help pe me navigate um, barriers. And because my f disability is mostly physical, that's really all I need in terms of help. You're more of a secondary person in that capacity. Um, and just, you know, making sure that Nick feels comfortable to know that he doesn't have any physical limitations when he is out with someone in that type of social setting, but also not feeling like, uh, he has a chaperone on his date or a third party in his date. Um, I think that um, there's this kind of stigma of like always kind of like trying to protect disabled people because they're fragile mm -hmm. and stuff, which I personally annoys me tremendously, but I've been able to have friends where they're like, okay, we're going to do this. But in that sense, is it's also complicated because you have to make sure that the person is is comfortable with. I have one of the things that was kind of difficult for me to kind of figure out is I had a friend and she was willing to help me go on walks and do things, right? Which is great. And then I was trying to kind of push that um, with other friends of mine and I realized that I can't really push it on someone. It has to be come out naturally in a sense. Like you guide them and you make sure that they're comfortable with it. And sometimes you kind of like reassure their fears. Um, but I think that it's this weird balance in terms of like as long as the person's okay with it and you're okay with it, why not? Uh, to be a human being is to do unsafe things. Now I'm not saying I'm gonna jump off a cliff, right? There's no uh, point of doing that, but it's kind of like you, you kind of, going out is basically like <laughs> risking your, your, not, drastically, right, but you're, you are risking your well-being in a sense, like you could walk across, the way I like to think about it is like you could walk across the street and get hit by a car every day, right, but we don't think about it because we have to cross the street to get things done, right? You know what I mean? Also, I would say a major goal of working with someone with any type of disability, be it physical, mental, any aspect, the biggest goal that you want to do is to build up their autonomy. You want to encourage them to be as self-sufficient as possible, and you want to provide a resource for them to have more mobility, to have less of a dependent or need on paid staff. That is, that should always be a goal in um, anything that you do. Uh, as part, especially with person-centered planning, the, the ultimate goal in that is for that person to achieve as authentic of a life as possible on their own terms. So the more people that Nick integrates with from the campus community, the more access he has to friends and resources and supports that are not just paid staff, the fuller uh, his life will be because at different points in time he will transition from staff. He may transition from the number of staff. He may not work with these people. And the more people he has in his life that he feel b builds connections and pathways with that are genuine, that provide so supports to him with no financial obligation involved, the fuller his life will become. Ultimately, the things that he's doing, decisions that he makes are Nicholas's, for better or for worse. So even when I'm there with him on the campus, I'm not concerning myself with, oh, oh you're going to this party, what are you doing, or oh, you have to study in the morning. I can propose things to Nick to consider, but ultimately Nick makes the decisions. Nick dictates and guides 
and plans his own schedule. And that I, if anything, encourage him to the extreme amount to make sure that he is always doing that and that he's not allowing people to plan for him or decide for him or just go with what someone else is doing. And then if they make a mistake, then Kashif tells me I was wrong. Um, um, so, um, you know, you have these students who work for you, but they're also like your friends. And um, does that create any tension? Is there any issues between having someone who's a friend and who's an employee? Like, where is the line drawn? Um, does this create any problems? That's, that's something that I struggle with every day. And I was kind of, I've been thinking about, like, as we've, where I knew we were going to talk about this because it's kind of like a lot of the people who I work with, I know they're my friends, but it's kind of like I never know when to draw the line with the students. Kashif is a different problem because there's an age gap with Kashif, and I think that Kashif is more professional than the, the students. I think that um, a lot of the people, some people I know who I hired, I know from middle school, right? So we have history together, and we were. I, none of, we, I wasn't friends with any of them back then, but we were friendly, and now we're friends. And I think about things of like, I've made friends that have been directly friends of my age, right? So then I think about things like, are they friends of mine? Are they friends because I'm hanging out with my aides? Or is that aide my friend because I'm paying them to be my friend and taking me to social events? or not, and I think that because my aides are so involved in my life and they show me um, uh, parts of their lives, I think that, that the question gets more and more complicated. But what I tell myself is that human friendships and human connections are complicated, you know what I mean? I think that, um, I think that they could be my friend and they could get something out of it. The way I see it is you get something out of friendship anyways. You like that person and I don't think they'd be working for me if they didn't like me. And they also do favors. I also hang out with them outside of, of the uh, clock, which brings up a whole argument of like ethics. But I think that it, it has helped me made fr make friends and it has helped me become a more social person. And I think that the circumstance of how it came about isn't something that I should look in, into too much unless it becomes a problem, and so far it hasn't. One thing I can say that I like to see um, was when Nicholas was doing a stand-up comedy event on the campus. Um, it was an evening event, and I went just to see um, Nick perform off the clock, and I was very happy to see that pretty much the, if not all of our staff, were there knowing that only one of them could have been on the clock for that performance working with him, right. but the fact that the rest of them were all there just to see and support him, that to me is a positive, healthy environment as far as for him as a student. Because though, yes, he, um, it is a job, but it, the job is the business of his life. So Nick, could you uh, tell us a little bit about the kind of help you need? Because looking at you on TV, it may not be clear the full extent about your disability and how much help you really do need. I know, I look too sexy on camera. Um, <laughs> but, um, so basically, I'm just gonna run through my day to day, right? So basically I wake up and someone helps me out of bed and then someone helps me into the bathroom, out of the bathroom to take a shower, to sit in chairs. Um, basically most physical daily tasks to get from point A to point B. Nicholas has myself there as a living A as well as his personal care coordinator. I work on a full-time average hours, 35 to 40 hours a week. Um, if you do the math, there's 160 hours in a week. Uh, you only sleep eight hours a day. So there's a lot of other time in the day, even when you have a full-time staff, that needs to be scheduled and calculated because Nicholas does not have the luxury of being able to just get up and go when he wants to. He can't just get up and go to the bathroom the way the average person can. He can't just run to the dining hall to grab something if he wants to or just pop out for a movie whenever he feels like it. It takes coordination and it takes planning. So with that, Nick has seven part-time staff that work with him that are student aides. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. All right. <laughs> Is that correct? Because it changes. So I believe we're at seven. So they work on average between eight to 12 hours a week, um, given some will work more than others, depending on the week's activities. Um, 
So that includes every activity you can think of from escorting Nick to class. If there's a package that he needs to get for the mailroom, escorting him there, helping him to get meals, helping him if he wants to go visit a friend in a dorm room, if he wants to have a friend over, when he uses the bathroom, if he's going to a study um, appointment, if he's meeting with the professor after class, if he's going on a trip on the weekend with the school, if he's just going to the movies, he's going to dinner off campus, if he needs someone to come by and help him with his laundry, to if he then needed somebody to take him to the dining hall, if he wants to go buy grocery shopping, or if he just wants to do any other activities. All those things are planned and require an additional level of coordination that the average person doesn't have to worry about because they physically coordinate and operate their own bodies. I don't go grocery shopping. I go to Chipotle. Um, <laughs> but, yeah. He's only allotted so many hours under his self-direction program for staffing, so it's very important that we efficiently uh, use and, and, and allocate times to most make the most of those times so he can do as many activities that he wants to. And so that we're not wasting any times where he may not need a staff, uh, that he could be having that private time for himself, and then there may be another activity that we can start. So, Nick, could you talk a little bit about what you're doing academically? I know you originally wanted to be a poli-sci major, and now you're talking about a double major in anthropology and history. How are your grades? How's the academics working for you? Because it's not just about partying and socialization, is it? My grades are good. I got a 3.7. Um, so How did your staff help you academically? Just uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah they helped me. Oh yeah, that's an, another thing. I've been able to become successful in college also because they're able to help me in a way that like in high school that it was harder to do. They're able to they help me type so my essays are done more efficiently and quickly. Um, they help me kind of like organize my schedule. So I'm like, okay, I have to study for this, that, and the third. So I make a little plan and they help me execute that plan. Stuff like that. Um, I'm able to take notes and read for the first time in my academic experience because it's hard for me to like flip through the book and then put the book down and be like, what page was that again? And jot down notes. Now I could jot down notes, still read, and I'm able to kind of like go back when I'm writing essays and be like, okay, I want this quote on page 86 or whatever. And I'm able to write better essays and produce the best that I can produce. Okay, this has been Ability Fierce. And uh, we're on every Sunday night at 8 o'clock on Brooklyn Free Speech TV. You can see us on YouTube, on our YouTube channel. You can see us on our webpage, www.abilityfierce.com. We're on Twitter. We're on um, Instagram. Follow us. Uh, we need all the numbers and the support we can get because we're leading an abilities revolution. We're doing something so that people who are disabled and their families don't have to be defined by their disability and that they get the services they're entitled to in a timely and dignified manner. Um, hopefully it was informative. Thanks a lot. Um, when does this come out? Uh, not this Sunday, but next. Happy Sunday. <laughs> Chief, any final concluding thoughts? Happy Sunday. Thank you and take <laughs> care. <laughs> Bye. Okay. See ya. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.